Welcome back to your engineering mechanics lecture and today we're going to pick up where we left off. In fact we are making our life a little bit simpler because we will start to look into composite shapes rather than the shapes defined by functions. So let's take a look at our objectives here. Number one we want to take a look at composite shapes or composite bodies. I sometimes use those terms interchangeably and we will talk about the first area moment. That is something that we started last class and we will actually use nothing new mathematically. We will only make our life simpler and make our equations simpler. So to do that I would first like to define composite bodies. What does that mean in this class and what is a composite shape or a composite body? Again I use those terms interchangeably but probably the better word would be a composite shape here. Then I will explain to you how to discretize such shapes and that is nothing else than breaking them down into shapes of known geometric features. So we will discretize them or break them down so that we have finite shapes, shapes that we understand what they are. That is another goal of today. And then ultimately, of course, we want to calculate the centroid location of those different shapes that have various geometric features but geometric features that we are very familiar with and that we don't have to describe by functions anymore. So let's get started and let's talk about composite bodies. In fact maybe composite bodies is not the good word, maybe it's better to say shapes. And what is a composite shape? So a composite shape is really a combination of combination of various known shapes and maybe I should call that simple shapes. So those sh simple shapes I know every geometric feature of them. So known shape here means I know all geometric features. So what does that mean? That means, for example, I know the area. I know A. I'm going to call it AI, right? So A subscript I. I also know the centroid location. So remember that the centroid location is described by x bar, so I'm going to call that x bar i, and I also know y bar i. And therefore I also know, if you remember back our last lecture, I also know x tilde i and y tilde i. And I know technically other things, but those are not important for this lecture right now. So it's a known area and it's a known centroid location, so I will say that again. So known area and known centroid location. And now if you remember what we really talked about last class, you can probably already guesstimate where we're going with this. So for example, if you remember our formula last class, it was x bar was equal to the infinite summation of xi dA divided by the summation of dA. And now we're going to turn this into a finite space, right? So where here this is the summation sign for infinite amounts of summation and this is an infinitesimal small area, I'm now going to make those finite. So the formula looks very similar just in its finite form. So x bar now becomes the summation of x tilde i times a i and the whole thing divided by the summation of a i. So it's quite similar in the fact that the formula has the same shape, if you will, just that I take it from infinite to finite 
and then my x tilde is just one that I know within the shape and my DA becomes an area of known shape. And so you can probably already tell that this here at the bottom is nothing else than the total area. And in fact, let's write that down for our other direction. Y bar is equal to the summation of Y tilde AI divided by the summation of AI. And just to be clear, the summation of X tilde I, AI is divided by A total. And I guess this will make more sense once we move on to the next section in where we talk about infinitesimally small areas taken to the finite area on an example. But let's complete this here. AI uh, divided by A total. All right, so now let's take a hands-on example that's still in a general sense. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a random coordinate system somewhere here. So I have an X and a Y coordinate system. And within that coordinate system, I'm now going to put a random shape. So let's pretend that I have a shape that looks like this. And then maybe a circle, semicircle here. Okay. And so our goal in the future will be to understand where is the centroid location of this. So let's say I need to find, find this point which has coordinates pretty much x tilde and y tilde for the total shape. So let's pretend this here would be x tilde. And then this here would be y tilde. And to get that, what we have to do is look at our formula here on the top right. So I'm going to highlight those for you. So these two formulas here on the top is really what we need. So let me highlight those for you. And the way we're going to use them now is we want to identify individual areas with their individual centroid distance. So keep in mind that usually you only know where this location is, you don't know where this is. In fact, this is what you're after. You want to find where is that centroid location of this entire shape. And this is my formula that will help me to do that. So the first thing I have to do now is to discretize it into these areas. So let me show you that. So for example, I have a rectangle here that could go in this direction here. And that rectangle, I'm going to call my A1, right? So I'm going to call this here A1. And I'm going to call my triangle A2 and my circle or semicircle A3. And each one of them have an individual centroid location. So for example, A1 is exactly here in the middle. Then A2 has it at the third point and third point. So that would be somewhere here, let's say. And then the semicircle has it located somewhere there. And I'll be honest with you, for a circle, I don't know this distance from here to here from the top of my head. I will in a second write that down for you, but this is something you can find uh, tabulated in textbooks or like on the internet, obviously nowadays. But right now we're talking about the concept of how to use this formula. So let me continue with the X, I and the y tilde i, I should say, x tilde i and y tilde i. So that's what I'm going to define now for each of these next shapes. So let's start with my a1. So my a1, for example, has an x i that goes from here to here, x tilde i, I should say. And then it has a y 
tilde i y tilde one actually i should call this and to make this correct let's actually fix the overall one here so that would only go up to here and now let's talk at the about the other ones so keep in mind that you are looking at the coordinate origin and that you want to define everything from the coordinate origin so now comes the first trick or the first thing that's probably not immediately obvious and that is that x tilde 2 would be the distance from here to here so that would be x tilde 2 and y tilde 2 would be the distance from the origin to the centroid of that shape so this would be y tilde 2. Let's continue with shape number three since I'm here on the right side I'm going to continue there with the y tilde so my y tilde would really be this distance from here to here y tilde 3 and then last but not least our x tilde 3 would be the distance from the origin to the individual centroid location of that shape and it's important to understand that here on purpose I drew the centroid location a little bit further to the right than this one and this one because these will be exactly in the middle of this entire shape here but this will move a little bit to the right because if you add this triangle here on the side it will have to move it brings the entire weight of the entire system further to the right but once again the important here the important thing here is that you understand the connection between these two formulas specifically what is ai and xi and y uh, y tilde i in relation to this picture and so let me repeat that for you one more time you always want to identify individual shapes for example shape one and then you can easily calculate the area content and then you also know where the centroid location of that individual shape is located relative to your point of origin and that's very important so the way i call this distance here for example x tilde one is the distance between the individual shape centroid and the origin of the coordinate system and for this shape here it's usually very simple and easy for students to follow but it becomes a little bit more tricky when the shape itself is not attached to the centroid location sorry to the origin of the coordinate system so for example this shape here so for this shape we have the distance here being one third in fact let me maybe include that here so you would have let's say this distance being let's say b so this here would be b times 2 over 3 whereas this here would be one third b right and so if now i also give another distance to this shape here let's say this would be i don't know w white then my x two, tilde 2 would be equal to w plus one third b and that is important to understand how that works and that concept works continuously for each of these problems so let's talk about a few hiccups that sometimes happen when applying these formulas or questions that I often get from students. For example, a common thing is like, hey, why can I not just find all my individual elements and then just sum them up and divide it by the total area? And that is not possible because here in this formula, we are talking about a summation of many multiplications. So for example, you have to find the x i x tilde i1 and a i1 multiply them with each other and then do this for x tilde 2 and a2 multiply them with each other and then add them together and that is different than just summing up everything that you find here on the top so that is a common hiccup that um, students experience or a common confusion that students have initially but because you have the multiplication here on the top you cannot just blindly sum up everything and divide it the, the 
complete summation by the total area or like some students even think they come to me and say hey why does this not cancel out because i have a total here on the bottom and a lot of a's on the top that together will give me the a total but again it's the multiplication here that prevents you from crossing those out from each other so that is a common confusion so please keep that in mind of course that applies to both of these formulas and so to get the complete answer here on the bottom or to for completeness reasons i probably also should then here add that a total is equal to a1 plus a2 plus a3 and let's talk conceptually about a few things here real quick before we move on to problem solving so if i look back at this formula what do i get my x tilde i is in millimeters or in meters whichever unit you want to use but it's a length unit let's say millimeters here and then my ai is usually in millimeter square right and it has to be in the same dimensions and you divide it by area which is also in millimeters squared and that's why at the end you end up with millimeters so that of course is something we know from our last lecture but we know that the x tilde or the x bar sorry is needs to be in a length unit right so x bar needs to be in length unit and the same is true for y bar so that's also needs to be in millimeter but millimeter i'm just using here as an example in reality it's a length length units right so that is concept number one last but not least what would happen if you were to drill a hole somewhere in this shape so let's pretend i'm drilling a hole right here so this is my hole and now i have removed material from this location and that means that hole shifts the centroid location so if i look at this before drilling the hole the centroid location was right here now i drilled a hole to the left of the centroid that means that effectively i have more material on the right than i have on the left and therefore my centroid would move to the right side so let's take a note of that and let's say that if i have an, a hole which is a negative area if you will i would have to subtract it here right so this distance would still be positive or this distance would still be positive this would be a negative area and i also have to subtract it here so it can happen that you have to deal with the summation of negative parts in this equation and that can be possible so let's write that down so holes in shape are considered negative areas and must be subtracted so that is important to understand and i think with that we have covered all our bases for these types of problems of course at the end it only comes through practice but i believe we have deciphered these two formulas now and we have conceptually derived every component of them now it's a question of how we apply that and we will practice that on the next page so here we see a very educational problem that should help us to grasp the concept a little bit better and in more detail so let's first examine the problem and understand what's going on so number one we have to find x bar and y bar that's our task here and we already see here that it is a composite shape and the composite shape here is no secret is really three shapes let me section that for you so i effectively have the triangle the rectangle and then let me explain to you that this circle here represents a hole I hope that's obvious from the picture but if not let me tell you this is a hole so therefore again educational problem it will teach us what to do with negative areas and of course in reality negative areas don't exist but a hole can be subtracted but I will show that to you as we go through this problem now so let's remember that our formulas again was 
x bar is equal to the summation of x tilde i times a i and the whole thing divided by the summation of a i's. And just for my reference, I also write down my y formula because I will need that as well. And that is very similar. Summation a i. So the first thing I now need to do is identify my individual shapes, my defined known shapes. And in this case, I will make my life easy. And I know that I have a triangle here. So I'm going to call that here shape number one. And then I have a rectangle here. I'm going to call that shape number two. And then last but not least, I have my shape number three, which is the area of the circle, which is a hole, right? So I, ha I will have to subtract that. So now all I would have to do is identify each of these elements for my individual shapes and then sum, sum them correctly. So let's, for an example, talk about this first shape here, the triangle. I can clearly find x tilde i, I can find a i, and I can find the contribution to the total area. Um, let me tell you before I start this problem that if you find other methods online or other teachers who will probably teach you this with like a tabulized method, I will show you later how that works as well. But I find that always a little bit risky. In fact, I have seen students who just want to follow a recipe instead of following the logic of the problem. So I think that's not a good first step to learn. Like if I show you the table and you just want to fill in the blanks, it's not conducive towards you understanding the problem. So let's for this problem not use the table method. I will explain that to you later, but let's instead just focus on the individual elements. So let's get started by looking at our individual shapes here. For example, shape number one has a centroid location roughly at this location. Shape number two and three share a centroid location right there. So the first thing I'm going to do now is identify these in my sketch for our very first educational problem here. Remember that we always do it in reference to the coordinate direction. So this here would be x tilde 1, which in this case happens to be 2 third of 300. So that would be that distance. And then the next x tilde, x tilde 2 and 3 would be the distance from here to here. So that would be x tilde 2, which is equal to x tilde 3 in this case, which is equal to 300 plus 150. We can continue with that and work on our y tilde directly. So let's do that. So our y tildes are directed along the vertical axis. So I have the first one here and then the second one here. And if I bring that over from here, then I have these distances and of course the x-axis. So let me zoom in. This here would be y tilde 1 and this would be y tilde 2. 2, which also happens to be y tilde 3. Uh, since I don't have much room down there, I will now cut, write that down here. y tilde 1 is equal to the height times 1 third. So that's 200 times 1 third. And y tilde 2 is equal to y tilde 3, which is equal to 1 half of 200 which is actually also shown to you right here. And now I have to find my areas. So let's do that. So my area for shape number one is one half times base times height, right? So A1 is equal to one half times base, which is 300 times 200 which is the height and that results in 30,000 millimeters square strange large numbers here right but the millimeters are so small so 
Now we can do a two, which happens to be 300 in width times 200 in height, which is twice the area of the previous one, which happens to be 60,000 millimeters squared. And now be careful because A3 is really a negative area because it's our hole. So pi r squared would be 75 squared. And that is a negative area of 17,671.5 technically millimeter squared. And now I almost have everything I need just for completeness reasons, I'm going to give myself here the little input or the little help. I didn't calculate those earlier, so I'm going to include that this is 200, this is 450 millimeters. Just so it's easier for me to use that in the formulator on. And then up here, I kind of forget that as well. So my Y tilde 1 was 66.5. 66 six or 67 and my y tilde 2 was equal to 100 and of course those are also in millimeters and now i have everything i need to complete these formulas here on the top right i have my a eyes i have my x tilde eyes and i have my y tilde eyes maybe for completeness reasons we will add now that the total area here is equal to a1 plus a2 plus a3, which in our case happens to be equal to 72,328.5 millimeter square. So that's the entire area content of that shape. And now all I have to do is use this these formulas here. So let's start with x bar. I'm going to find that for you first so x bar happens to be x tilde one how much was that that was 200 millimeters and then i multiply that by the area which is 30,000 millimeters squared and then it's a summation so now i'm going to add to that the x tilde 2 which was equal to 450 millimeters and I multiply that by the area which was 60,000 millimeters squared and now comes the tricky part because now comes the negative portion and that is both the area and the lever arm if you want to call it that way or the distance so I'm going to subtract the entire thing which was equal to 450 millimeters. And the area in this case was 17,671.5 millimeter square. And that now is everything I need for that portion. Now I have to divide it by the total area. So let's put in the division bar here. And now I divide it by the total area, which is 72,328.5 millimeter squared. And the first observation that I can make is that I have millimeter to the three divided by millimeter squared. And that is good because that means that I end up with millimeters. And that is what I want. In fact, the solution, the numerical solution to this is 346.3, 346.3 millimeters. And that is a result. So I'm double underlining it. And of course my units belong in square brackets. And now let's take a look at the picture. Is this number meaningful or does it make sense in the content of this picture? And I think it does because 346 is 
beyond this triangle to the right, but not half of the rectangle. So let me explain that in other words, if I were to have a rectangular block that was completed like this, no triangle here, no circle taken away, then we would know from the very beginning that our centroid would be here. However, we removed a triangular portion here. That means our centroid location would move to the right. And then we remove the circle, which means our centroid location moves a little bit back to the left. And so the 346.3 does make sense. In fact, for full points on my exam, I would have to include that in my sketch. And so the first thing, of course, it has to be symbolic, but you have to show that you can see the difference between X bar and Y bar. So I first will draw this line here and I'm going to call this now X bar, this distance from here to here. So let's call this here X bar, which is equal to 346.3. Three millimeters. And I show that I understand where that centroid location is. And by the way, something similar is true for X for Y bar. So if we had a complete area here, then Y bar was exactly half of 200. So it needs to be less than 200. Right. Um, and however, we also removing this. So we'll see if this area has a bigger contribution than this, but it should be somewhere between the middle and this point. So we will calculate that next. In fact, let's do that. Let's calculate our Y bar. So let's calculate Y bar, which now would be Y tilde one, which was equal to 66.67. So that you see where it's coming from. Let me zoom out a little bit and then multiply it by the 30,000. And, and you notice I don't use units here right now, just to save you some time. Now my Y tilde two was, e was equal to 100. And I multiply that by 60,000. And then again, negative 100 multiplied by the very same area, 17. 671.5 and of course to no surprise my total area did not change so I can just divide everything by 72,328.5 and this comes out to be 86.18 86.18 millimeters and does this make sense I think it absolutely does because if we look at the picture here, the 86 is definitely below the half of the shape. And so I can now include that in my picture up here. So let's say that this here is the location. And so this distance to here, maybe I should show it on the other side because it's easier to observe. So the distance here, would be Y bar, and that is 86.18 millimeters. And so now I clearly showed in my sketch the difference between X bar and Y bar, and it also shows that I understand that the centroid location is right here. In fact, I probably should make that even more clear. I should say that here, is my centroid location. So this is the centroid location. And with that said, I think we solved the entire problem. Here's everything at one view. Important for us to understand here is that we know how to use every individual component in these equations, which I believe I showed you here. And then solving everything below here is just plug and chuck. Once you understand where each component comes from, then you can just blindly follow these equations. The last important thing then is that you 
clearly show where the centroid location is because it is my experience that often students can calculate these numbers correctly because they can plug and chuck well, but they cannot show where that is located on the actual sketch. And therefore, it's very important to me that in your final answer sketch, you actually include the location of the centroid and you also clearly show what is y bar and what is x bar. And when you do that, then you can get full points for this and you understand the complete topic. And that concludes this problem. Let's take a look at our next problems just for practice, for additional practice purposes. So here we have a problem for the centroid location with a fairly simple shape. So centroid location, again, we're trying to find x bar and y bar. And this problem also gives me a good opportunity to talk to you about the reason for us as engineers to calculate the centroid locations. What you see here is a barrier or like a traffic barrier. It could be something else, but let's just pretend for a second this is a traffic barrier. And this traffic barrier has a centroid location. And I'm just guesstimating right now. I'm saying that maybe it's somewhere here. Maybe it's actually within those triangles there below. But of course, there's then a centroid axis. So let me draw that into the problem here that would be located somewhere along this axis. So that would be pretty much the centroid location. And if you now have a traffic approaching it from the side, you want to have it such that the actual car has the centroid location acting below the centroid. So if the car, and this here represents my car, it's a very poor car, I, I admit that, but just conceptually speaking, so if the car approaches this barrier from the side, it wants to cause this to tip over, and it is much more difficult for the barrier to tip over if the force of the car hits the barrier below the centroid location, because then it will just push it to the side, whereas if you uh, hit it here on the top, you would actually tip it over. And of course, this is an educational problem. So in reality, these dimensions are not like this. In fact, the traffic barrier of these dimensions would be completely useless. But I guess you get the point, right? So you, you need to be able as an engineer to calculate the location of the centroid so that you can plan, for example, traffic barriers properly and such. But for the purpose of this problem, I will now erase all these marks on here. And I will now show you how we can calculate such centroid locations for a fairly simple shape. In fact, let's talk about the shape first. Let me zoom in here. So I first, remember, have to discretize the shape into shapes of known geometry. And I could, for example, do it like this. So I have like a vertical component and then I have this horizontal component on the bottom which would run from here to here and this would be an absolute fair way of absolutely okay way to discretize this image however just to show you that there's also another way in this case i will erase this now again and i will show you that you will reach the same result if you discretize in a different way and that could be, for example, like this, where the horizontal part on the bottom is continuous and the vertical component is not continuous anymore. And that is what I will use actually to now solve my problem. In fact, you can see now that I have this shape, let's call this here A1. So this here will be my A1. And then let's have a red shape A2 which would be this down here. So this would be A2. And then I have, I guess, what's called A3, area three, but I'm gonna call that area 3A because on the other side, I have area three as well. So this would be A3, but I'm gonna call that B. And why do I differentiate those? Technically, if I was already experienced with this, I probably wouldn't have to do this, but just to get one point across here, I want to point out that the coordinate origin is here at the center of this shape. And so 
area A three B is to the right of that, and area three A is to the left of it. And so one of them has to be negative, whereas the other one will be positive. And by that I mean actually the x tilde has to be negative. In fact, let's talk about the x tilde real quick. So remember that I have to con calculate x bar here. And x bar is usually some formula, but in this case, I really don't have to calculate that. It actually happens to be zero due to symmetry. So you can see here that the y-axis is exactly halfway between shape A1, if you will, or in the middle of shape A1 and also in the middle of A2. And therefore, I don't have to do any calculations. I know for a fact that because this cross-section is symmetric, that the centroid location must be located somewhere on the y-axis. The distance from the x-axis, which will be actually y bar, that I will have to calculate now. And I will have to find out how to do that. So I think we should get started on that. And as I promised you, I will do this now with the tabulated method. So which again is not always a good way, but maybe we can use this to get ourselves familiarized with the tabulated method. So what do I need? Like our formulas, maybe I should write down the formula first. So the formulas that I usually have is the sum of y tilde i a i divided by the sum a i. And so I need to find certain things. I need to define a i, I need a i, y tilde i, and then a total, and then also the summation of that. So a standard table for problems like this that you often find in textbooks looks as follows. So first we have the shape and then we have the area. And the area is in this case given an inch square. Then we have X tilde I, which is usually given in inch. And then we have Y tilde I, which is also given an inch. And those are entities that I can pretty much read from the picture. So these are geometric properties. However, we also have the computational properties, if you will. And that, for example, would be x i, x tilde i a i and y tilde i a i. But we'll talk about those in a little bit. However, so let's turn this into a table now. So I have my rows like that. And now I have to populate the table with four shapes, right? Remember, I have pretty much A1, I have A2, and I have A3A and A3B. And I will now consecutively go through those and explain to you where which value comes from. So the area for shape number one is fairly straightforward. And let me make sure that I keep the picture here for you visible. So the area A1 has a base times height of one inch multiplied by 7.5 inch, right? 7.5. And so that is 7.5 inch squared. Maybe I should put a equal sign here. Now, what is X tilde for that shape? So let's look at that. So x tilde is really the distance, remember, from the centroid location of the individual shape to the origin of the coordinate system. So I will zoom in now to give you a geometric reference here. So let's say I have a centroid location right here. And the first thing you see is that the centroid location of the shape A1 coincides with the y-axis. We talked about this before, but that means that I have a distance in the x direction so my, of zero, which means that my x tilde will be zero. However, for the y direction, it's a little bit different and a little bit tricky. So I will give you references for those as well. So let's say I wanna know from this location here, so from here to here. 
and that distance would be 7.5 divided by 2. So 7.5 divided by 2. Why 7.5 divided by 2? A lot of students would have taken 6 divided by 2, but keep in mind that your cross-section actually goes all the way down to here, which includes the 1.5. 1 1.5 1 .5 plus 6 is 7.5 and divided by 2 because we're looking at a rectangle. So this distance must be 7.2 divided by 7.5 divided by 2, sorry. And so, but the, the distance that's even more interesting for us is the one here on the bottom, which of course is the same, but now I give you the full number. So 7.5 divided by 2 is 3.75. And now when I go to populate my table, I have to be careful because x tilde i is zero, right? Because the distance in the x direction from the centroid to the origin of the coordinate system is zero. Like there's no movement to the left or to the right or no distance. Whereas for the y direction, this is very different. I am looking from this centroid location of the individual shape to the origin of my randomly chosen coordinate system. So that distance is not just 3.75. In fact, it's 3.75 plus one. So that is very important to understand. So 3.75 plus 1, and together that makes it 4.75, sorry. And now we have all the values for shape A1. Let's next look at shape A2. And you already see that it's also a rectangle, therefore there must be a centroid location right there. And once again, it coincides with my y-axis. That means in the x-direction, there's zero distance. Accordingly, my x-direction here is zero. Um, and my y-direction is one divided by two, which is equal to 0.5. Last but not least, I, of course, have to calculate the area. That is something we all can do. So that is six times one, and that is equal to six square inch. And once again, because it's the first time we're really doing these problems, so the distance from the centroid of the individual shape to the coordinate origin. And so it's zero because there's no distance in the x direction, but it's one half of the height here of one, because from here to here, it's one half. Let's move on to our A3. A and B, and I simultaneously will draw these in there. So let's say there's a centroid location right here. Remember, like one third and two third. So one third and two third, or in this case, both times one thirds, but one third from the heavy side, two side from the light side, uh, two thirds from the light side. So my A3A is, first of all, the area is one half base times height base be careful now because the base is only 2.5 it's not 3 2.5 times 1.5 and that calculates to be 1.875 1.875 again be very careful because here we subtracted half an inch from the base right so common mistake in an exam is that students take the three inch here but in reality, you have to subtract a half inch. So that makes it 2.5 times 1.5, a half because it's a triangle, and you end up with the 1.875. Now, more interesting maybe is to find the x direction. So this now has to be calculated because, if I may remember, remind you, that we are now looking for the distance from here to here in the x direction and in the y direction. So in the x direction it would be this distance and in the y direction it would be this distance. Put that into numbers now and we do that in our table here. So and I think we can still see what's going on there. So for my x direction first I have to take the half inch so 0.5 because that's half the width of the middle piece of A1 plus so, sorry, in this case, it's actually negative, right? We're talking about the piece here on the left side. So I'm going from here to here. So that's negative. So minus 0 0.5 
and I just put it in brackets. So plus the one third times 2.5. So one third times 2.5. That is my distance here. And that distance happens to be negative 1.33. Okay, now for the y direction, it's similar. But now I need to look from the bottom to here. So that's the one plus the one third of 1.5. So let's put that in numbers. So I have plus in this case one and plus one third times 1.5. And that happens to be equal to 1.5. All right, so now we can do this for the second shape, which of course the area content is the same. It's 1.875. My x tilde now goes to the right side. So let me show you that. Now we're going from here to here in the x direction. So in the right side. So therefore we'll have the same numerical number here, but it will be positive. So let's make that positive 1.33. And in the y direction, it still remains positive, right? So both of them were positive. So plus 1.5. And now we have calculated all the numerical values that we really need for this. And in fact, I'm going to now draw a horizontal, sorry, vertical line through my table here, because I want to explain to you that everything to the left of this line is observational, right? So everything here is from observation. Whereas everything to the right, you do calculations, right? So everything on the right side is really only plug and chuck. And I can calculate that for you real quick. So obviously, xi, which is zero, times the area is zero. Here, the same thing, zero times something is still zero. And then I multiply these values and I'm gonna fill them in for you real quick. So here I have zero, zero, and my 2.5 here and 2.5 here. However, be careful, one of them, of course, is negative, right? So my first one was negative. And so if I have a summation line underneath this, because I'm done with all my shapes here, then I can say that the summation here of this column, so I'm going to make a summation column that is zero here. And this is actually the reason, this zero here is the reason why we were allowed to say that we use symmetry to claim that x bar is equal to zero. So we kind of proved it here. However, for my y bar, that will be different. There will actually be a value here. And so let's fill in the blanks here real quick. So my 7.5 times 4.75, that's 35.625. So 35.625. And by the way, notice that this is in inch to the three, right? And now my next area, that was six times one half. That's easy. That's 3.0. And then 1.87 times 1.5, right? Is that correct? Yes. So that's 2.812. 2.8125, if you will. And then 2.8125. And when I sum all that up, I end up with 44.25. And again, this is an inch square uh, cubed. And by the way, just to be clear, this here also would be an inch cubed, right? Don't want to keep any information away from you. So now I have this summed up. I need to do one more computation, right? I need the sum of my AI. Where do I get that from? Here's the area. These are my AI, so all I have to do is sum this one up. So let's do that. If I calculate that, I will end up with 17.25. And now let's 
look at our formula. What do I really need? I need my AI here. So I pretend that's this value down here and my summation of yi ai that's what i find here on the bottom right in this case so ultimately i end up with a formula that says 44.25 inch to the cubed divided by 17.25 inch squared and that results ultimately in 2.565 2.565 inch and that is a result and the one we were asking for so last thing i now have to do is pretty much put that into my sketch and the 2.565 does make sense because it is very bottom heavy that shape so let's put it in here. So 2.565 would be somewhere here is really where that centroid location is. And to communicate my understanding, I have to draw that in my figure here. So I'm going to draw from here to here. And then I have this distance from here to here, which is y bar, which is equal to 2.565. And notice that I also have a second information now in this picture, and that is the distance to the top, which would be equal to the distance from here to here, if I can get my ruler aligned. So in this direction, and that would be equal to 8.5, 8.5 minus 2.565. And you may ask yourself, why is he showing us this? But often the problems ask you for the distance either from the bottom or from the top. And it really doesn't matter what you like, how you start. I could have, for example, put my x-axis here on the top, and then I would have calculated um, my equations differently with different values. But I would have found pretty much this number, whatever comes out of this here, right? So what I'm saying is, it doesn't matter what you calculate as long as you know the reference to it. You can always deduce your other values, and I believe that kind of sums up the entire problem i will say though yes this tabular method here does make sense for larger shapes i think for a shape like this is a complete overkill i showed it to you here for educational purpose and hopefully you can make the best out of it and my experience is that students like it because they can just plug and chuck however i think on an exam for example you spend too much time doing this rather than just fulfilling the formula so like this for this shape i i think i could have been faster maybe by half if i would have just fu fulfilled my formulas however if i have a shape that is made of many different maybe 25 different shapes then i would struggle with just filling everything into the formula and then i would obviously try to structureize my approach and maybe even use a spreadsheet program and I encourage you to maybe try one of your homework problems with a spreadsheet program. Um, and please understand that your, spread, your, your spreadsheet program is very smart in the sense of computation and it can calculate many values for you. However, this part here really depends on the engineer. So you have to submit the right values here. And that can be very tricky sometimes. For example, you can easily overlook this half inch here, or you can uh, confuse one third with two thirds and so on. So that requires some practice. And I invite you to do that. However, be, let's take a look at the last problem in this lecture series. And then I think you have all the tools you need to complete your own homework and to really understand how to solve these centroid pro problems for composite shapes. So here's another problem which I will not really solve for you. I leave this up to you. 
It is very similar to what we've done before. I just want to give you a few hints for this. So number one, let's look at what you need to find. So you need to find X bar and Y bar as always in this lecture. And also you want to understand that there's a hole here with a diameter of one foot. So before I continue to talk about that let me give you the answer to this problem so x bar in this problem actually happens to be 2.11 and in this problem it happens to be feet and y bar happens to be 1.34 feet 1.34 feet and now what you need to be careful about so the circle has to be subtracted and then here is a semicircle and that semicircle lays on the left side of this coordinate axis of the y direction. So that means everything here on the left side has to be subtractive if you considering this your origin, similar to the problem that we solved before. Right? And then also the circle has to be subtractive, but that one has a complete center. So it's a complete circle which has its center right on this axis, so your distance there will be zero. And I'll let you play with that. Just one last thing I need to tell you, and that is that you have this semicircle here. There's a semicircle here, an entire semicircle. And that needs to, you need to know how to find the centroid location for that, right? So let me just give you a hint for that. So for a semicircle, Let's pretend it looks like this. So let's say there's a centroid location right there. Of course, you know already that like for a semicircle in this direction, let's call that Y bar or Y tilde would be equal to R, right? Because R is effectively this distance here from the center of that line to any point on that circle so we'll call that r but the distance that you probably have never seen before or never calculated before is actually this distance from here to here and again you can find this on the internet or in tabulated like books or mechanics books and any mechanics reference but for your convenience i will tell you that this distance can be calculated by 4r divided by 3 pi and that is the centroid distance in this case x tilde for a semicircle right so let me show you that like this so this is the formula you need to calculate that and i really encourage you to do that because it will help you to be prepared for the exam because the things that I usually expect my students to do on the final exam is to have the formulas for the very simple shapes in their head of course for rectangles for triangles and for semicircles right? And everything else, for example, parabolic shapes or trapezoidal shapes, those exist, but they would not come on the exam without any warning. So what we can say with confidence is that these you have to know for the exam. Know for exam. And what I mean by that is you need to know how to calculate A. You need to know how to find X tilde I. And you need to know how to find y tilde i and later on after the next lecture you also will need to know how to find i x and i y but that is something we will talk about during the next lecture so for now the things that you need to focus on is these three guys for these known shapes everything else exists and if i put anything else on an exam i would of course add the information or these formulas just like i did here I would provide these formulas then if I go beyond these shapes on the final exam. All right, so I think with that you can solve this problem and I believe we conclude the lecture here. So let's take a look and please ask yourself 
what you have learned here and what your takeaways are. Maybe even more important, what is not clear to you yet and how do you get clarification for that. But ultimately, let's understand that at this point we can clearly discretize our shapes into shapes of known geometry. So I think I can clearly state that. And then I know how to calculate the centroid of composite shapes. I did that. That was the focus of today's lecture. And I believe we have only two but very important points here that we can check off that will lead us a long way. And let me finish this lecture by telling you that this is the basis calculating the centroid location. That is the basis for our last lecture on what's called moment of inertia. So you will see that in one of the next videos. We will talk about moment of inertia there. So moment of inertia. And if you don't know how to calculate X bar and Y bar for a shape, you will not know how to proceed. So remember how we used to have internal forces. and internal force diagrams, to calculate those, you needed support reactions, right? So I always make the analogy to my students that X bar and Y bar to moment of inertia is the same as the support reactions to internal forces. If you don't understand the beginning part, so if you do not understand the top line here, you cannot understand the bottom line here. And so please take your time and really understand, especially this one, the lecture that we did here today, which is for the finite shapes. So that is very important because we will do the moment of inertia for finite shapes or for composite shapes, as we called it here. So next lecture will be all about moment of inertia for finite shapes and composite bodies. And so you really have to have a good handle on these two. And I wish you good luck with that. And I hope I provided you the tools that you need and then we can meet in the next lecture. Before we do that, let's take a quick look at the homework just to see if there are any questions there. So here our first homework problem, straightforward because it's already broken down into defined shapes for you, rectangle, rectangle and rectangle. And you can probably simply calculate the X bar and Y bar location for that. I don't need to explain a lot here. Similar with the double T here. So this is a double T cross section, very common in engineering. That can be a lot of fun to calculate, but also it's very straightforward. And notice that it is the symmetric over the Y axis. So that will help you just like the previous problem. Now more interesting is probably this problem to you from a concept conceptual standpoints where you need to calculate X bar and Y bar. So you can break this down into many shapes. In this case, I suggest that you actually create an entire rectangle here and then subtract this because it's much easier to subtract a quarter circle than it is to add this shape here that you would create when you have a rectangle here and then you have this like carved out circle. And it's like here, it doesn't matter if you add it or subtract it, but it's probably easier in the context of the entire problem if you subtract this entire area, the entire triangle. And then last but not least, there's a 3D picture, but not to worry about it. It looks complicated initially, but really what you have to worry about is this front surface really, right? So the front surface here, that is the only thing where you have to calculate the centroid because in this direction, so let me maybe call that, let me give that an, a dimension. So let's say this is X, this is Y, and then this is Z. If I were you, I would focus on the Y Z plane first. So Y Z plane, because in the X direction, everything is constant, right? So in this direction, all the lengths are equal. So in the X direction. And so you can just focus on the Y Z plane and you can then pretty much make it a 3D problem by adding the third direction, which is not really making it a 3D problem, just adding a third 
uh, number to your calculations there, which is just half of the distance in the z direction. So, and that's why without a lot of explanation, we can ask you to find x bar, y bar, and z bar. And of course, you can rename this, right? If you if you're confused by the y z plane, then you could you might as well turn this here into x y and z axis if you wanted to but i leave that up to you and i wish you good luck with that that concludes the lecture and the homework and i believe that should be straightforward i encourage you to also find other problems to solve this because once again all this here is very important to our following topic which is the moment of inertia and you will be 100 percent lost if you don't know how to find the centroid location of a shape so what we will continue next with is we will take such a shape or such a shape and we will find the moment of inertia for this of course right now you may not have an idea of what the moment of inertia is of a cross section but that is what we will focus on in our next lecture my point here is we're not doing this here just to waste your time like what we did in this lecture is a very important topic to understand the next topic which is the moment of inertia and so please focus on these types of problems and maybe find even additional problems to solve and good luck with that and i'll see you in the next lecture